baseball. This is a simple game. You throw the ball, you hit the ball, you catch the ball. A game rich in history and tradition. And you lot of get the ball around the end. You lollygag your way down to first. You lollygag in and out of the dugout. A game that gets a little bit weird. You know what that makes you, Larry? Lollygag. Lollygaggers. This is the Lollygaggers Podcast. Now here's your host, Chris Bull Brom. Oh, well, excuse me for having an opinion, pal. Well, well, well. Hey, howdy ho, and welcome to episode three of the Lollygaggers podcast. I'm Chris Bullbrom, your host. For those of you who are uh, new to the show, welcome. If you're a baseball fan, casual or otherwise, you have come to the right place, my friend. Each week, we explore the stories, the legends, the records, the curses, and all that cool stuff surrounding the game of baseball. Last week, we talked about the curse of the Bambino. If you haven't checked out last week's show, I highly, go re- I highly recommend you go check it out. Uh, the week before that, we talked about the economics of the current state of baseball. What does it cost the average American fan to go watch their favorite Major League Baseball team? Again, if you haven't had a chance to listen, please go check it out on uh, your favorite listening source for podcasts as well as on uh, YouTube. And if you're not new to the show, welcome back. We missed you. Now, before we get into this week's show, if your business or organization would like to sponsor the Lollygaggers podcast, don't be afraid to reach out and let us know. Shoot me an email at the Lollygaggers podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to check us out on the social medias, the Lollygaggers podcast on Facebook at Lollygagger underscore pod on Twitter. Help us to help you, as they say in the biz. <laughs> There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. No crying. Once again, this is the Lollygaggers podcast. I'm Chris Bullbrom, your host. And today we're talking about spiders. Hey, I'm scared of spiders, coach. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not what I meant. Me too, coach. I'm afraid of spiders too, coach. Yeah. Goddamn spiders freak me too, fellas. <laughs> well, I didn't mean that, though. You know, what I'm talking Especially about. Especially in your beard, man. Ever get one of those spiders crawling up your arm, man? Oh, and then he crawling on you, man? Oh, damn. Well, thanks, Jumbo. You can just rock me to sleep tonight. Yes, spiders, but not those kind of spiders. Bees. 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 I don't know about them bees. <laughs> Guys, no, we're not talking about bees. We're not talking about the creepy, crawly kind of spiders that climb up water spouts and get washed away. No, we're talking about... The Cleveland Spiders, the predecessor of the Cleveland Indians. Now, of course, the Cleveland Guardians. And while we're on that topic, I can't be the only one that was thoroughly disappointed that when the Cleveland Baseball Club decided to step away from the controversial Indians nickname and explore other team name options, that the Spiders didn't make the cut. I mean, I I get the reasoning. I understand the reasoning behind the Guardian's nickname. I understand its ties to the city of Cleveland, the statues on the highway welcoming folks into Cleveland. I get all that. But A, going back to the Cleveland Spiders name, would allow you to acknowledge the rich baseball history that Cleveland possesses. And let me tell you, there is a ton of baseball history in Cleveland. But also, two, Spiders are so much cooler than, than Guardians, right? Unless it's Guardians of the Galaxy, which they're not. They're just the Guardians. Uh, Spiders is just a, it's a cooler nickname, right? And and you get the logo and the marketing and the merchandising opportunities with Spiders. And, well, as you can tell, I've invested way too much intellectual time thinking about this. So, anyway, we're not dedicating today's show to me bitching and complaining about a team's nickname and why there are so many cooler options out there besides Guardians. We'll save that for another show. <laughs> no, today we're hopping in the Wayback Machine to talk about the 1899 Cleveland Spiders, statistically the worst team in the history of Major League Baseball. Hello, Peabody here. I believe that every dog should have a boy. 
That's why I adopted Sherman. Shall I set the Wayback controls, Mr. Peabody? Yes, Sherman, you may set the Wayback machine for the year 1875. All right, first off, is Mr. Peabody and Sherman a dusty, old, dated reference? Like, I'm hoping not, but I feel like for a portion of the listeners, the, the, that whole segue went completely over their heads, and they're completely oblivious to just how cool that segue actually was. Because kids these days, right? Now, before we get into the worst of the worst, a little bit of history surrounding the Cleveland Spiders Baseball Club. The Spiders were a relatively short-lived organization. Uh, They were in existence from 1887 to 1899, so 12 years, right, if my math is right there. Now, the 1899 Cleveland Spiders were so bad that the team ceased to exist from that point forward. But the organization was started when streetcar tycoon Frank DeHaas Robison received the go-ahead to, re- to uh, start a franchise in Cleveland to play in the American Association in 1887. Now, the American Association was sort of a competing league with the National League, which at the time was basically Major League Baseball. It was, when, when we think of, you know, the roots of Major League Baseball as we know it now, that was the National League. The American Association was an offshoot, sort of a competing league trying to be at the same level, but not quite there yet. Uh, the Cleveland Spiders would play in the AA for two seasons before moving to the National League for the 1889 season, and they would remain there in the much more competitive National League for the duration of their existence. Now, see, the Spiders were not actually the Spiders to begin with. When they started the Cleveland franchise in 1887, they started as the Forest Cities and went by that name or by the Cleveland Blues in both 1887 and 1889. Now, that was the second time that a team started in Cleveland was called the Cleveland Blues. Uh, The first one flamed out. This one, obviously, didn't last much longer. Um, While they were a member of the American Association, they were the Cleveland Blues, or again, the Forest Cities. Then, um, after a couple of less than stellar seasons, the uh, Cleveland Blues were singing the blues. (laughs) After finishing 39-92, and in 1887 and a slightly less awful 50 and 82 in 1888. It was following that 1888 season that the blues decided maybe a change of scenery, a new name might be what they needed to kind of spur that team into, into relevancy. So despite less than stellar play, their first two seasons, they joined the much more prominent national league and became the Cleveland spiders. And if you like me, wondering how you get the nickname Spiders for a team from Cleveland, it has actually nothing to do with the arachnids themselves. See, I thought maybe there's like a prominence of spiders in Cleveland. Like maybe they have a lot of spiders there. I don't know. There's a weird spider migration that goes through Cleveland. I didn't know. Turns out the whole reason they called them the Cleveland Spiders is because there were several very tall, skinny players on the Cleveland roster, and people went, y'all look like spiders. And so the Cleveland Blues became the Cleveland Spiders. It it was different times, the 1800s. You know, nowadays we give teams names that reflect something relevant to their location. Again, the Guardians, ties to the city of Cleveland, Um, some kind of historical reference or a monument of some kind. Maybe it references the landscape of where a team is located um, or, or an animal that's known to that area. I mean, you've got the, uh, the Colorado Rockies, obviously the Rocky mountains, the St. Louis Cardinals, the state bird is the Cardinal in Missouri. So it, it, you know, it makes sense, right? But uh, no, back then they looked at a team of scrawny, scrappy ball players and said, Yeah, you guys look like a bunch of spiders. So now you're the Cleveland Spiders. Ah, the good old days. Anywho, with a new nickname and a new eight-team National League to navigate, made up of the New York Giants, the Boston Bean Eaters, the Chicago White Stockings, the Philadelphia Quakers, the Pittsburgh Alleghenies, the Indianapolis Hoosiers, the Washington Nationals, and, of course, the beloved Cleveland Spiders, 
Cleveland would go on to finish sixth in their premier season in the National League. At 61-72, and 72, the Spiders finished two and a half games ahead of the Indianapolis Hoosiers, who finished in seventh, and 15 and a half games ahead of the last place Washington Nationals. Things didn't really improve much, if at all, really, in 1890 or 1891. Spiders finished well below 500 in each of those seasons. Also, through their first five years of existence, the Cleveland Spiders kind of looked like a failed venture. Kind of looked like maybe Mr. Robison made a, a bad investment because uh, they had a total win-loss record of 259 wins and 408 losses. And no more than 65 wins in any of those first five seasons of existence. So not what you would consider a hot start for the Cleveland baseball team. But in the waning weeks of that 1891 season, player manager Oliver Patsy Tebow took over leadership of the ball club. And um, let's just say he brought with him a renewed spirit. When you talk about the... Uh, the colorful personalities of baseball, and there have been a ton. I mean, we talked about Babe Ruth last week. He was very much a colorful personality. Ty Cobb, despite his um, accolades on the ball field, was not liked by very many people because he was kind of a jerk and definitely colorful, to say the least. And um, Oliver Patsy Tebow was as colorful as they came. If... Uh, if there was any notion that baseball in the late 1800s and early 1900s was a quote-unquote gentleman's game, <laughs> yeah, Patsy took that notion, shoved it in the dirt, spat on it, spiked it with his cleats, and then sent it running home because he had no time for that nonsense. He was from the mean streets of St. Louis, grew up in a... In a it was either a gang that played baseball occasionally or a baseball team that was also a gang. One of the two, I'm not entirely sure. There may have been some singing and dancing numbers that went along with it. I, I'm not sure if that was how that worked. Some sort of Broadway musical. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Tabo not afraid to get himself into a brawl with opposing teams, opposing players, his own team, umpires, fans, whatever. Um... He, he was he was a tough guy. He was the definition of a tough guy, but he wasn't just a guy that, you know, went and blew his lid and, and lost his temper. He was very, very smart when it came to baseball. He was a brilliant baseball tactician. And uh, under his guidance, the Cleveland Spiders went from 65 and 74 in 1891 to 93 and 56 in 1892. So, in the course of a year, they went from finishing, uh, what, nine games under 500 to winning 93 games. Again, this, this organization had never won more than 65 games in a season. Then Tebow takes over his first full year as a player manager. They win 93 games. They lose 56. They um, ended up in the essentially the 1892 version of the World Series and got swept by the Boston Bean Eaters with the exception of one game they tied because back then you could still tie. Um, but they came they came that close to a championship that year. And uh, actually under Tebow, the Spiders were one of only two teams that made money in 1892 because back then owning a baseball franchise was really, it, it wasn't about making money. It was more about just the prestige of saying you owned a baseball club because uh, a lot of those were, were failing business ventures early on. So uh, just two teams actually made money in 1892 and the Spiders were one of them. Uh, it was a world of difference under their new, albeit unorthodox, leadership. Um, Patsy Tebow is one of those uh, personalities that we could honestly and dedicate an entire episode of the lollygaggers podcast to in fact we may just do that one of these shows we may just uh dedicate an entire episode to oliver patsy to but it wasn't just the arrival of patsy that took the spiders from meh to championship contender it was also the blossoming of their star pitcher one mr denton true young or as you may know him cy young i know him I know him. Yeah, the winningest pitcher in Major League Baseball history 
with 511 career wins, a number unlikely to ever be bested, spent the first nine years of his illustrious career with the Cleveland Spiders starting in 1890 and leaving after the 1898 season. We'll explain why he left uh, in just a moment. But uh, in those nine years, Cy was, uh, he was the ace. He was the go-to guy for the Cleveland Spiders. Of course, his name is Denton True Young. He eventually became known as the Cyclone. And then eventually fans just shortened Cyclone down to Cy, and that's how you got Cy Young. Again, that's another character that we could dedicate an entire episode to. But um, in those nine seasons, the Spiders finished above 508 of them. Uh, the only season they didn't was his first year in 1890, his rookie season. But after that, um, they always finished above 500, seven consecutive seasons. And Cy Young was the best pitcher in baseball in 1892. He had a league-leading 36 wins to just 12 losses, which is insane. 48 starts in a season is unheard of nowadays. A 1.93 ERA, which we talked about last week when we were talking about Babe Ruth. Anything under two is otherworldly. Um, That also led the league, by the way, the 1.93 ERA. He had nine shutouts that season in 1892, which also led the league. And a whip, that's walks and hits per inning pitched. And if... You're not familiar with some of the stats surrounding baseball when you talk about pitchers and whip. It's basically how many base runners they allow per start or per inning. Um, Walks and hits, you add those two together, and then you divide by the number of innings pitched. And his whip was just 1.062, which, uh, again, was best in the league and means he was allowing about one base runner an inning. And uh, twice in his Cleveland tenure, Cy Young led the league in wins. He had 36 in 1892. He had 35 in 1895. And then after leaving Cleveland, would go on to put up, you know, spectacular Hall of Fame numbers the rest of his career. And it was actually on the strength of their pitching staff in an era of baseball when offense was, you know, generally hard to come by, that the Cleveland Spiders would enjoy their most success as a franchise. They finished second or third four different times between 1892 and 1898. They never fell below 500 in any of those seasons. They went seven consecutive seasons with a plus 500 record, and they never quite lived up to that 93 and 56 record from 19, uh, from 1892, but they were still a quality ball club each and every year. So that begs the question, right? How does a team go from being amongst the best in the National League to compiling the worst season in baseball history? I, and when I say worst... I mean a level of futility that will likely never be matched. Oh, no! We suck again! (laughs) Oh, boy. Did they ever suck again in 1899, the Cleveland Spiders, which is saying a lot because, again, this is a team that had gone seven consecutive seasons with a winning record. They finished second in back-to-back years to the Baltimore Orioles in the regular season. And in those two seasons, in 1895 and 1896, they played the Orioles in the postseason series for baseball's Temple Cup, which was sort of the precursor to the uh, World Series trophy that they get now. Defeating the Orioles in 1895, they lost to Baltimore in 1896. So how do you fall from grace that quickly? How do you start at the top and absolutely plummet to the bottom? And not just plummet to the bottom. I'm talking like through the floorboards, into the basement, through the, you know, concrete base of the building and into the dirt below. That's how far the Cleveland spiders fell from um, 1888 to 18 or excuse me, 1898 to 1899. I'll get the numbers right. Um, And all of that, all of it had to do with the owner, Frank Robinson, the man responsible for bringing baseball to Cleveland also became the man responsible for chasing it out of town. You remember the movie major league? which again centered around a baseball team in Cleveland where the cricket owner, um, Rachel Phelps, Rachel Phelps was the owner and she attempted to stack the Cleveland Indians roster with a bunch of terrible players also ran guys at the tail end of their career guys. Nobody had ever heard of. And the whole idea was to tank the team 
get fan attendance to drop, and allow her to move the team to Miami, which is where she wanted to be, which is where more money was, more fans, etc. Well, that storyline may very well have some roots in actual history because it's not far off from what actually happened to the Cleveland Spiders. Unlike the movie Major League, no happy ending for the Spiders, though. Of course, you know, in Major League, the guys went, hey, you know what, if they think we're going to lose, we're going to show them, and they went on to win the pennant, and everybody's like, holy cow, they did it. Look at this team of, you know, scrappy, no-name players, and and then they became contenders. That, that was not the case for the Cleveland Spiders. And instead of tanking the team to drive down fan attendance, it was actually the lack of fan attendance to begin with that caused Robinson to hack apart a winning baseball team and create what was maybe the worst organization in the history of professional sports. Paying attendance today is 1412. Prior to the turn of the 1900s, owning multiple baseball teams in one league was was legal. It was allowed. You could own multiple teams within the same league. Obviously, now looking at it, you're like, well, that's a major conflict of interest. Yeah, they didn't think about that back then. And so Frank Robison and his brother Stanley Robison, who had um, eventually joined Spider Ownership um, partway through their tenure in Cleveland, decided that they were going to take advantage of that opportunity, and they bought the bankrupt St. Louis Browns in 1899. They then renamed the team the St. Louis Perfectos, and eventually those would those that team would eventually become the uh, the Cardinals, of course. Those brothers, Frank and Stanley Robinson, then decided that St. Louis was actually a better market for selling tickets and building a, a franchise fan base. And if, anybody who's familiar with baseball knows that the the St. Louis Cardinals have one of the most rabid fan bases in all of baseball. And there's a reason for that, because that organization over the years has become kind of the gold standard for success in baseball. But um, the brothers Robinson decided, you know what, St. Louis is a better place to get fans, to build a fan base, sell tickets, all that. So they hatched what can only be described as um, an evil scheme. They became a couple of Bond villains and decided that uh, they were going to ship all of Cleveland's best players to Missouri and turn the Perfectos into uh, essentially a National League dynasty and leave the Spiders to be some sort of baseball sideshow. Just face it. You guys stink. The Cleveland Spiders went from having six, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six future Hall of Famers on the roster. Cy Young, John Clarkson, Bobby Wallace, Jesse Burkett, George Davis, and Buck Ewing. And again, if you're not a, you know, super intense baseball fan or a baseball historian, the only name you recognize on that list is probably Cy Young. But all six of those guys would eventually end up in the Hall of Fame. And all six of them were on the Cleveland Spiders roster going into the 1899 season. And the Robinson brothers shipped them off to St. Louis and left the Spiders with the equivalent of a startup minor league team. I mean, not not even a minor league team that had been around for a few years. I'm talking like a first-year minor league team that had to pluck players from other minor league team benches to fill roster spots. And we're grabbing people off the street corner going, hey, can you throw a ball? Because we, we need some extra people to fill some spots. That's how bad the roster was for the Cleveland Spiders. In fact... Player manager Joe Quinn, who took over the team partway through the 1899 season after an abysmal start, which on, honestly was just an abysmal season, he was one of the only players that had um, any sort of professional baseball experience. Thus, why he got the manager's job while also being a player. And in a bit of an inauspicious start, call it karma, call it whatever you want, Um, The Cleveland Spiders actually opened the 1899 season against the St. Louis Perfectos. The team that the Robinsons had gutted had to take on the team that they had stacked full of talent. And it ended about the way you'd expect. The Perfectos won 10 to 1. um, And one of the Cleveland newspapers ran an article titled, The Farce Has Begun. 
And there's no better word to describe the 1899 season for the Cleveland Spiders than a farce. Um, They soon became known as the Cleveland Exiles, the Forsakens, the Misfits. After an 8 and 30 start to the season, let me refer, let me let me say that again. An eight and thirty start to the season. Lave Cross was let go, and Joe Quinn took over. And uh, eventually, well, the the Spiders accomplished a lot of major league firsts in that eighteen ninety nine season. How'd we ever win eight? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Here's a look at some of those quote unquote accomplishments. They finished the year with twenty wins and 134 losses. They went 20 and 134. Their 13% winning percentage is a record low that I don't think will ever be matched. I don't think you'll ever see a team that bad. The Oakland Athletics this year, they're pretty bad. They're still not as bad as the 13% winning percentage of the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. Um, The Spiders endured six separate losing streak of at least 10 games. Let me say that again. Six different losing streaks of 10 or more games during that 1899 season, including a Major League Baseball record 24-game losing streak as part of an unfathomable 1-40 and finish to the season. That season saw the Spiders finish 84 games behind first place Brooklyn, 35 games behind the next to last place team, the Washington Senators. They were historically bad offensively, finishing at the bottom of the league in runs, hits, doubles, triples, home runs, walks, stolen bases, on-base percentage, and slugging percentage. Basically every offensive category. And here's the kicker. For an organization who got shredded because the fan attendance wasn't what the owners thought it should be, just 6,088 people attended home games for the entire season. Not 6,088 as the average for the year. No, the entire season saw a total of 6,088 fans attend home games. In fact, attendance was so bad that other teams refused to come play in Cleveland forcing the Spiders to play most of the season's 154 games on the road. 112 games, to be exact, were played away from Cleveland. And uh, I believe they played just seven home games after July, which is just insane. Really, the only bright spot came on May 21st when the Spiders capped their longest winning streak of 1899 at a whopping Two games. All right, you guys, let's listen up. We won a game yesterday. And if we win one today, that's two in a row. We win one tomorrow, that's called a winning streak. It has happened before. But perhaps the story that best sums up the 1899 Cleveland Spiders came in their final game of the season. Now, according to a number of sources, including Peter Morris's uh, Cracking Baseball's Cold Cases, the Spiders were playing a doubleheader in Cincinnati to finish up a 35-game road trip to end the season. The team stayed at the Gibson House, which was a hotel in downtown Cincinnati. A 19-year-old kid named Eddie Kolb, who sold tobacco products at the hotel, had dreamed of a baseball career. So the story goes that somehow Eddie Kolb convinced player manager Joe Quinn into letting him pitch the second game of the doubleheader on October 15th, 1899, which would of course be the final game of the regular season. That is Kolb's only game on his major league baseball career. He has one game played one start and it was that final game of the 1899 season for the Cleveland Spiders, a 19 year old tobacco salesman from the Gibson House Hotel in Cincinnati. Um, Morris, in his book, quotes the Plain Dealer newspaper writer as reporting that, quote, the outfielders did nothing but chase hits from the time bell, the bell rang until the last man was retired, end quote. In total, Kolb gave up 19 runs over eight innings. Only nine of those 19 runs were earned because the Spiders' defense was awful. 
Cole walked five, hit a batter, and struck out one poor unfortunate soul. The box score even referred to him as Holb, H-O-L-B, instead of Kolb, K-O-L-B, um, which quite honestly was a fitting end for the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. <laughs> Yes, sir. They love this club here in Cleveland. The Cleveland Spiders never played again after the day Eddie Kolb took the mound. The Robinsons' actions disgusted those around the game of baseball, and uh, the spectacle that played out over the 1899 season played a very large role, a prominent role, in the decision to ban owners from controlling more than one team at a time. Unfortunately for the Spiders, though, those changes were too little too late as the Spiders, along with three other National League teams, folded for good after the 1899 season. It was the end of the National League in Cleveland, but two short years later, local coal millionaire Charles Somers bought into a new startup league called the American League. And he became the owner of a new team in Cleveland. They would initially be the third iteration of the Cleveland Blues. But this time, they would actually stick around. They became the Bronchos in 1902, the Naps from 1903 to 1914, and then eventually became the Cleveland Indians in 1915, a nickname that would stick around until 2021 when owners felt it best to pursue a more culturally appropriate team name, thus changing the team's nickname one final time to the Cleveland Guardians starting in 2022. They are considered a separate franchise with no connection to the Spiders since one belonged to the National League. The current Cleveland team started in the American League. But let's be honest, try as they might, any baseball team that calls Cleveland home is going to have some connection, whether directly or indirectly, to the Cleveland Spiders. Most specifically, the 1899 Cleveland Spiders, the worst team in the history of Major League Baseball. Whether you try to avoid it or not, you, you just can't have one without the other. Now, before we go, since we're on the topic of futility and uh, just downright, downright awful performances... I have to offer up a correction. Baseball is all about hits, runs, errors, right? Well, yours truly booted a routine grounder last week on our episode about the curse of the Bambino. I mentioned that after the sale of Babe Ruth from the Boston Red Sox to the New York Yankees, that the Yanks went on to win four World Series titles with Babe Ruth and then 22 more before the end of the 20th century thus 26 World Series championships, right? Correct. But I then failed miserably to take into account New York's World Series win in 2009, part of the 21st century, and mentioned again that the Yankees had a total of 26 championships. If you do the math, it's actually 27 I even mentioned that New York hadn't won a World Series since 2009 and yet still failed to add it to the other 26. And so I, I didn't even follow my own advice and ask a Yankees fan how many World Series titles they had so I could have gotten accurate information. But I do want to say a big thank you to my longtime friend and broadcast partner, John Beltran, for catching that brutal error and um, making sure that we documented it in the scorebook so thanks jb i will work on being better going forward but for now join us next week as we stay in cleveland for a second week in a row and explore the incredible and truly unbelievable story of ray caldwell the big league pitcher who survived being struck by lightning while on the mound and then stayed in to finish the game and then made history three weeks later. Be sure to like and follow the Lollygaggers podcast on your favorite podcast listening platform. Join us on social media by liking the Lollygaggers podcast on Facebook 
And of course, follow at lollygagger underscore pod on Twitter. If you want to share your thoughts, opinions, ideas for future shows, if you want to point out any mistakes I might make, because I'm guessing that there will be plenty of them, shoot us an email at the lollygaggers podcast at gmail.com. And again, if your business or organization is interested in sponsoring the podcast, reach out and let us know. You can message us on those social media apps or, uh, again, email the lollygaggers podcast at gmail.com. But until we meet again, remember, in the words of the late, great Humphrey Bogart, a hot dog at the game beats roast beef at the Ritz. This has been the Lollygaggers podcast. In the words of Paul Harvey, now you know the rest of the story. I'm Chris Bullbrom. Good day. That's all we got. One hit. You can't say on here. Don't worry. Nobody's listening anyway. <laughs>